Good morning and welcome to CSIS. I'm John Alterman, Senior Vice President, Spigna Brzezinski Chair in Global Security and Geostrategy and the Director of the Middle East Program. I'm delighted to welcome today His Excellency Hoshiar Zabari for what I'm sure will be an insightful conversation about Iraq's ongoing political crisis. The fundamental issues with which we're concerned, the deadlock that's ensued since parliamentary elections in Iraq last October. Iraq is now experiencing the longest gap between elections and the formation of a government since adopting its constitution in 2005. The consensual political system that enables this impasse will be a central part of today's conversation. And we're fortunate to have one of Iraq's most seasoned statesmen here to speak with us. He's someone who can tackle both the national Iraqi and Kurdish perspectives on this matter. His Excellency Hoshar Zabari was Minister of Foreign Relations of the Republic of Iraq from 2003 to 2014, and briefly Deputy Prime Minister, then Minister of Finance from 2014 to 2016. He began his career as a member of the Kurdistan Democratic Party's Central Committee and Political Bureau. And in 1988, he was appointed to lead the party's foreign relations and to represent the KDP in the United States and the United Kingdom. In 1992, he was appointed as a member of the Iraqi National Congress's Executive Committee, and he was made a member of its Presidential Council in 1999. Hoshiar gave his last public presentation before we left our old headquarters at 1800 K Street in 2013, and I am delighted to welcome him back to CSAS. Hoshiar, Please help us understand what's happening. Well, it's very difficult. Thank you, John. I'm very pleased to be back at the CSIS in its new building. I remember the last meeting we had in your old building. Uh, the hall was packed, actually. It was summer, but it was very well attended. And it was the last event you held uh, in that old uh, building. But now to see you again in this new building, it's a pleasure. It's a delight to see you. See many friends here and those who are uh, following us also. Uh, what's happening in Iraq is, is very chaotic. I was on the phone just on my way here. I spoke to some people in the parliament. Today they had a session of the parliament uh, to renew the confidence of the speaker of the parliament, Mohammed Halbusi, which he passed. He, he submitted his resignation in order to show that he represent all spectrum of the political uh, scene in Iraq. So he had passed the test. Uh, secondly, they elected the first uh, deputy uh, the speaker, successfully also, somebody from the coordination framework, who's a Kurdish faili also. Uh, and uh, the third point is three Katyusha rockets have landed in the parliament compound, and uh, at least five people have been injured from the security. Uh, so the situation is very tense. And this process to reset the process and move forward without the participation of the Sadrist is very, very dangerous in my view. I don't think they will be able to <coughs> move further. They are planning to send uh, a senior level delegation today <coughs> or tomorrow to Hanana to see Sayyid Muqtada Sadr in Najaf in order to explain to him uh, and to engage him in this process, uh, not to alienate him or marginalize him, but uh, really it's not uh, absolutely sure whether he will receive them or not. But that is the intention. Uh, also today and yesterday, the Iranians have been shelling us in Kurdistan, in, in Erbil, in Soleimaniya today. The number of casualties is rising. In Khoisanjak, for instance, so far about nine people have been killed, about 30 have been injured. And this is uh, uh, an Iranian revenge of the Kurdish oppositionists who've been making claims that they, have, they are behind this current demonstration uh, in, in Iran, in Kurdistan, and uh, 
lady who was killed in Tehran by the ethics police and so on was also a Kurdish. So uh, this is the latest I have I, as I'm speaking to you. But the political process have been stalled, have been uh, paralyzed really, primarily by the by the court decision, by weaponizing the federal court decision as a political tool. Otherwise, after the October election, there were clear winners in the election, which was the cleanest election. Uh, although the low turnout was, was an indicative, but honestly, from 2005 until now, uh, Last election was the cleanest election, and um, it followed all the requirement of a new electoral law, biometric voting, uh, having a new electoral commission, having a judicial panel, having uh, an international monitor, let's say, to oversee the election. And three winners came out of that election, the Sadrists, the Sunnis, the Kurds from the KDP, and we wanted to form a majority government in order to be more independent, more sovereign, uh, to do reforms, to fight corruption. But uh, this process was halted, was halted by uh, utilizing the court decision against this coalition, not to move forward. And the outcome was the stalemate, uh, the paralysis of the whole political process until today. Today, we, we hope it will be a new beginning to move forward. But uh, in my view, my humble view, without the participation and the engagement of the Sadrist uh, or the Sadrist blessing for the new government, it would be very, very difficult to move. Also, people are planning to have, um, again, massive demonstration on the 1st of October to commemorate the October uprising of the Iraqi youth against the system and so on a few years ago. But uh, I believe the Sadrists would be part of that mass protest against, against any government formation. So <clears throat> the situation is not uh, promising, but uh, we are not hopeless. We hope that this move will push things uh, forward. And at least we will have a government, we will have a budget, and we will have services for the people in order to regain some of the confidence that has been lost over the last year or so. So let me just pick up on, on that point. The New York Times quoted an Iraqi Kurdish historian, Saad Iskandar, earlier this month saying, internally, externally, at the political level and at the security level, Iraq is now a failed state. The Iraqi state cannot project its authority over its territory or its people. Is would, Iraq a failed state? I wouldn't uh, agree with his assessment. I may say it's a fragile state, very fragile, and that is the assessment of the World Bank and international uh, financial organization who had a chance to meet them. But it's not a failed state like Somalia and others. Still, it has the potential, it has the resources, it has the people, it has the, the, the finances, you see, to be uh, a successful state in, in the region. Unfortunately, it all boiled down to lack of good governance. Uh, otherwise, really, this country have all the ingredient of being a successful country in the, in the region. Uh, and it's a historical state, it's an old state. We celebrated the hundred years of, of the creation of the Iraqi state uh, last year and so on. But um, it's a fragile state, definitely. Uh, there is a lot of, of uh, political discourse uh, among all the components, among the Shia community, among the Sunni communities, among the Kurdish communities at the same time. Uh, but the arbiter was the last election, actually, which everybody hoped that it will start a new beginning, but uh, due to foreign intervention and internal uh, conflict and self-interest, they didn't allow that project of forming a majority government to move forward. 
God, Although that's... partly that's a consequence of the Constitution, which it seems to me is, is trying to push Iraqis toward a more consensual system with supermajorities, which protects minorities, but also means it's hard well, to... Well, this is the interpretation of the federal court, which we disagree. We have our social contract in 2005. When we voted for this consti constitution, it was a grand bargain among all the communities. And the aim of that constitution was to prevent the rise of new dictatorship or authoritarian regime in, in the country uh, after Saddam Hussein. So that was, it created this check and balances uh, among the communities, the system was established on the basis, not a centralized system, but a federal system, which many Iraqis, unfortunately, even the intellectuals, don't believe in federalism. And that is one of the problems we, in Kurdistan region, have to argue over the years, uh, what is the prerogatives, the authorities, the jurisdiction of the federal government and the regional government. So this time, in fact, the court reinterpreted the Constitution. Otherwise, the path was very clear. You, in the first meeting, you elect the speaker, the two deputies, and then you go to elect the president. Uh, then the president will nominate the, the, the prime minister to form the government. That was what we have did since 2005. I mean, during the late Jalal Talabani, Fuad Masoom, the second president, and the third president, uh, Dr. Barham Saleh, that it's not uh, a necessity that two-thirds of, of this will vote for you in the first session. None of them in the past have reached the threshold of the two-thirds. So your feeling is that the problem is not the Constitution. It's the not the Constitution. It's the interpretation of the it Constitution. It is the interpretation of the Constitution, which especially now the court have been used as a, as a weapon against the opponents, actually, to silence them or to prevent them from achieving that goal. And that's why the Sadris, specifically the largest Shia political social movement, are so angry, so upset that they have been robbed of their victory, okay? Uh, and they installed some new people in their places, and they would not allow a new government to be formed. That is the dilemma, the simple truth. <laughs> so one of the consequences of this consensual system has been that the elections don't really change patronage, they don't change the distribution of power, that sort of everybody is brought on. And, and there are a lot of people who argue that that's created yeah. Well, that was the, the big struggle between majoritarian government and consensual government. Right. I mean, we were advocating a majoritarian government right. on the basis of the outcome of the election to set a new, a, new, a new start for the political process. But they brought us forcibly back to a consensual government where everybody is in it and nobody is taking responsibility or nobody is accountable for the success or the failure of the government. We, in my party, the KDP, were part of this consensual government from 2003 onward. But really, when we had uh, 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 reconsidered our position, that our service and the country's service will be better served to have a majority government. So we will be part of that, part of the decision making, and will take <coughs> full responsibility for the success or the failure of the government. Now, both the opposition and those who are in, in government, everybody want to be in it, and nobody's responsible, as, as it's happening with the current government and previous government, and it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And one of the ways it doesn't work is it creates what are thought to be deep patterns of corruption in Iraq, and, and yeah. Ali Alawi in his resignation letter as finance minister last month wrote of a vast octopus of corruption and deceit that has reached into every sector of the country's economy and institutions. It has to be dismantled at all costs if this country has survived. You were removed 
from your position as finance minister because of accusations of corruption. It was accusations of corruption that led the Supreme Court to say you weren't eligible to run for president. Why does Iraq create an environment where so many people are so fixated on what they say is just rampant corruption through the system? No, the corruption is rampant. I agree with you. And uh, when I was uh, the finance ministry, I discovered a case of uh, one private bank uh, and one person who was close to the ruling government who had managed to transfer about six billion four hundred million U.S. dollars within two years, okay, from the central bank. Uh, accounts outside through export license or import and so on. And um, uh, yes, it was true in 2016. I was uh, questioned by the parliament. I presented uh, myself and my evidence. And uh, there was no evidence of corruption whatsoever against me. There was no indictment. There was no charges. There was no legal court cases against me whatsoever, but it was a political decision at the time against me when we were fighting ISIS and the country was in ruin economically. We wanted to save the country from collapse. And my colleague, the defense minister, uh, Khalid al-Ubaidi, again, he was also had a no confidence vote. Okay. Uh, Anyway, we accepted that decision. This is a parliamentary decision, but uh, really no charges were, were proven. Uh, it was uh, political accusations by some people. Now, when I nominated myself for the presidency to go as member of this Save the, the Nation uh, coalition or the tripartite coalition, uh, I passed all the regulatory uh, commission that they investigated or checked, the integrity commission, the debatification, the criminal charges in the ministry, uh, interior ministry, and the parliament also voted me. So I was clear. There was nothing against me, against my character, or against my reputation. But still, when they realized that this coalition is going to win, they issued this unconstitutional decision to stop the coalition from electing a president except by two-thirds, or the obstructionist third, which they borrowed from Hezbollah from Lebanon, okay, and to stop me as the strongest candidate for this position. Okay? So again, actually, there was no indictment, no uh, cases against me whatsoever. So my conscience is very clear. I'm happy, OK? Otherwise, I will not be sitting down with you here in the CSIS. No, but, <laughs> okay. but, but, but no, the, no, I know. But, but the, the corruption, the is what, what Ali Alawi said, is absolutely right. I gave you only the tip of the iceberg. This is what I discovered. And I think that was one of the main reasons behind coming after me because I discovered a very, very se serious case of corruption. And the guy afterward actually was an elected member of the parliament and he became the deputy, <laughs> deputy chief of the integrity commissions in the parliament. <laughs> so I, Jana Raff, the, the yeah. New York Times yeah. bureau chief in Baghdad, I spoke to her for my yeah. podcast um, earlier in the year, and, and, and she said that there's a perception that corruption is totally endemic in everything, not just the government, but in every aspect of life in Iraq. Yeah. So, so as somebody who's thought about governing Iraq for many years, how do you root out the corruption? Well, with a new government, with a new government policies to go after this, uh, not to go after the, the small civil servants who have met taken some bribes and other, but uh, the structure of the corruption. I mean, it's embedded in the ministries, in the allocation of these ministries, and the ghost soldiers, and the, the security, and the PMF, and even in the Peshmerga force, let's be very honest with you, okay? And uh, also the contracting procedures that has been done. Uh, 
most of the corruption is happening in some of the key ministries. Oil ministry is number one, okay, which is a fifth of them divided between different. Uh, and the finance ministry within the custom border entry points or, or the ports and, and the airports and so on. And also in the trade ministry. So but everywhere there's money, there's the, corruption. Wherever there is money. So now when they talk about participation in the government, the first thing, which ministry has more money? You see that it should be allocated to me or you and, and others. But uh, really it needs leadership here, you see, to stand up. And the international commun community, the United States, the Treasury can help the government. They can track, track this money laundering or this money going out of the country. They can trace every single US dollar, how, how it's moving, how it's manipulated. Uh, so it needs some international help also in order to fight this corruption, endemic corruption. What is, what is there for Iraqis to do? I mean, you talked about leadership. What would Iraqi leadership on corruption look like, and how would you get it started, given Well, the we have many examples. Georgia was in endemic in corruption. They succeeded with the help. They did a great deal they of They weren't work. an oil producer. I know, no, no, but the, the measurement they, they took in order to be a successful story or in, in fighting corruption is always a case refer to. Uh, but uh, it needs leadership, definitely, you see, to stand up, to clear uh, this corruption. It, it will take time. I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, I don't want to give you a very optimistic picture because most of the political elite leadership is involved. And the system also is, is formed in a way now the competition is not on the on the minister's level, the deputies, not on the head of the department or the section from which party it could be, or which department has the control of the finance or of the money of, of the contracting and so on. And you hear many stories in, in Baghdad uh, when a ministry was burned down, it was the contract office that is always burned down in the health ministry or oil ministry or uh, and so on. I'm still not sure how we turn the corner on it. Well, how to turn the corner? There is no one fix, actually, to, to solve this problem. But it needs a coherent, a strong government and leadership uh, to make this issue of fighting corruption a key policy issue and they need international help also in that, and should be gradual, actually, to root it out. So it doesn't come by wishful thinking, I want to end corruption and it will be end. Yeah. Let me ask you about the, the Kurdistan region, which yes. has its own challenges with yes. corruption. They're, they're yes. leading families, the yes. Barzani families, yes. which are related, which controls uh, the Hook and Erbil provinces, Talibanis control the area around Soleimani, and there are, there are arguments now that there's a new generation of cousins yes. who are fighting for control of the spoils yes. of regions that families have controlled. Yes. I guess the question for you is, how should the U.S. government think about those yes. battles? Should the U.S. government care? Does the U.S. government have an interest in, yes. in changing the way Kurdistan works, or is this just an internal yes. matter? Well, for the United States, the only trusted, reliable ally they have in that entire region is Kurdistan, in my humble view. And I'm so happy, so glad that a few days ago, the DOD uh, signed uh, a new memorandum of understanding between the Pentagon and the Peshmerga forces for four more years. This is an indication that we are the trusted friends and allies of the United States. Corruption is widespread. I'm not saying it's only in Basra, in Baghdad. In Kurdistan, there is corruption. But if you come and look at the development, the prosperity of the North compared to Diwaniya or Nasiriya, uh, there is no comparison whatsoever. Even our Arab brothers who visit us as tourists 
or uh, seasonal tourists to see in summer when they came, they see the difference. So we tell them, well, here is, there is also corruption, but at least some money is being put aside for the development and the prosperity of the infrastructure, of the building, of the maintenance of, of this region. So there is anti-corruption efforts also in Kurdistan, actually. People are brought to courts and so on. But I'm not denying that there is no, okay? And still it needs to be done. On the Barzanis or the Talabani, yes, but the Barzanis have the legitimacy, okay? The, some people say, well, if somebody will go to Arbil, he has to see Masoud Barzani, Nechirvan Barzani, Masroor Barzani, the yes, they are. And the reason, because they are elected leaders by their own. They have not imposed themselves on others. So they, are, they have the legitimacy of the Kurdish people or nation. Talabani also, they are there, are historic. But, no, but, no. But, but, but there are cousins who aren't elected, who are, you know, involved. No, in... no, the party actually won the election. The KDP right. was the largest party in Iraq in terms of the numbers it had got. Uh, after the Sadrist, we were the largest party who had 760,000 votes in Iraq. In the regional election, also, we had the largest number of seats in the parliament. And we could have done without the PUK to form a government, a majority government. I was a negotiator. Uh, we waited for nine months for them to come and join the government. Okay? A problem our brothers in the PUK have, they see a parity. No matter what was the outcome of the election, they need to share the region on the basis of 50-50. These days are gone, you see. I mean, if we believe in democracy, in the outcome of the election, they have to respect the outcome of the election. The, the flip side is that if you believe in democracy, then you don't have only Barzanis and only Talibanis leading. It's the open. Regions. Other people are also fighting and competing, but they are come ahead. So what can you do? That's one way to see it. I mean, it, no, no. I mean, the criteria, the arbiter, is the outcome of the election. There are some new opposition also who came and competed with us, the new generation, Goran, the Islamist, okay? But always the KDP came ahead first. So that's the destiny. If, if you believe in democracy, if you don't believe in democracy, it's something else. <laughs> and in terms of, of unelected positions, should the yeah. U.S. care about how, how the unelected intelligence services and other things operate, or is that... Is no, there is a system. Have? The KRG has its own system. As a federal region, uh, we built this, uh, this entity since 1992. I mean, uh, when we had our first election yeah. at that time. By the way, everybody was opposing uh, the KRG going for election. Turkey, Iran, Saddam Hussein, Syria. Even our American friends at that time were not very enthusiastic about this, but we went ahead, we took a decision, so we set up this, uh, this administration, a regional local administration. And now it's become a de facto, it's been part of the Iraqi constitution, recognized it as a, a, a federal entity, part of, of, of the same country. Right. Um, the Iraqi Supreme Court ruled in February in a decision you said was profoundly political, yes. that the 2007 law that gave the Kurdistan regional government the authority to operate its own oil industry yeah. independently was unconstitutional. What's the way forward, both practically and politically, Well, just to decision? give you an example how the federal court is weaponized and politicized, okay? The moment everybody realized that this uh, coalition of the three parties are going to form a government and win, they took a number of decisions, political decisions, against the coalition, against me, and against the KRG, oil and gas industry at the same time. This was an old case back to 2012. Some people uh, have uh, made a case against the KRG that its oil and gas sales are illegal, it's not within constitution, and uh, so they brought this case back, okay, 
in, in February 2020, after, after 10 years, after 10 years, they picked up this file and brought it, and they decided to see that uh, your uh, law of uh, oil and gas in the KRG is illegal and has to be centralized. So this is, again, we back to the same problem. Do we have a federal country that has combined us, has made us to live together, or a central, centralized, bathist, authoritarian thinking, you see? Well, well everything... where do we go with it? I mean, I, so, I, I, no, no, no. I, I agree. I'm with you on the analysis. The okay. question is, where do we go? I no, mean, no, I, what's where, where do we go? We're back to the Constitution. I mean, that's our, our social contract. The, the, the Constitution gives the KRG the right to explore, produce, export its oil, but to make an accounting with the central government. We are not benefiting, we are not living as many of the propaganda of some extremist Shia uh, sectarian leaders promote that we are living on the benefits or the oils or the wealth of Basra or Diwaniya and so on. This is wrong. This is not true. Okay? So we have, we have our rights in the Constitution. And it's a constitutional issue. We are challenging them with the same court, with the same ruling. We have our lawyers. We have our cases. That what we are doing is within the jurisdiction of the KRG as was defined in the Constitution. So do you think the solution can be found within the court system, or is it going to require a, no, political, it's political. a political deal? No, it's political. No, we are engaged in a political process to form a new government. So one of our, our demands, actually, for taking part in any, any future government, as this issue needs to be frozen, not to, threat, to issue threat every day, the Ministry of Oil against international oil companies, American uh, CEOs, uh, uh, service companies, oil buyers, and, and so on. That this has to be, to be freezed and to start a technical process between the expert from the oil ministry, from the Ministry of, of uh, Mineral Resources in, in Kurdistan, in order to propose a new uh, oil and gas legislation in the first parliament that will, will be convened. And that is the, the only solution. We proposed that back in 2007. And that, that was the deal. Okay, let's have a law that regulates what is my duties, what's my responsibility, and what's yours. If you give me my share of the budget or the fiscal federalism that I need more than anything else, then you can take everything away. But they are not doing that. We didn't export oil until Baghdad government or Maliki's government stopped all payments to the KRG. So literally, really, they're pushing you outside of, of, of this country, deliberately. I, I'll tell you a joke. I was a member of Haider Abadi's uh, cabinet when he complained that, uh, well, the custom revenues are not collected in the north and so on. So he said uh, uh, to set up some customs near Diyala for the incoming trucks from Kurdistan into Baghdad. I said, as a finance minister, Mr. Prime Minister, I really may disagree with you. As a Kurd, I think you are drawing the lines of my country, you see. You are separating <laughs> us deliberately. I mean, this is not the way to run a, a united country, Mr. Prime Minister. I have a few more questions, but Please. I want to tell our audience, both Please. here in the studio and at home, that there's a way to magically send questions to me up Please. here. Uh, so I wanted some audience questions, too. But I have more for you. You know, one is, we're almost 20 years after the U.S. liberation yes. of Iraq. What is the current U.S. obligation to Iraq? What do you think the U.S. needs to do? And how would you explain it to somebody in Ohio who says, that's really far away? Yeah. 
Well, I think the United States have invested a great deal of blood, of treasure, in helping Iraq and liberating Iraq from dictatorship. And we are grateful to all those sacrifices, all those helps. I am so proud during my visit, wherever I go, many people recognize me and talk to me in bars, in restaurants, on the streets, those who have served in Iraq or in Kurdistan. And they have a very, very soft spot for the people, for the country that they were. And this is in itself really make, make you very happy. Not to mention the diplomats, the military, and in the Congress I meet my many friends who served in the no-fly zones in the 90s or on the ground as uh, uh, military, uh, uh, helping the Kurds to save the Kurds and so on. But uh, I think Iraq is a very, very important country. The United States has some very strategic interest there. Uh, Iraq is not Afghanistan, as we saw the withdrawal from the country abruptly, you see, and the scenes we have seen. What we hear from our American friends, they focus actually that uh, Iraq is, is, is unimportant. Still, we have troops there, we have engagement, we have one of the largest embassies there. The largest consulate is being built in Erbil, so they are there to stay. They are not going to abandon us or leave us or throw us under the bus. Okay, and Iraq as, as such is, is so critical for the Gulf, for the region, and the competition with, with Russia and the consequences of the Russian aggression in Ukraine, with China and Taiwan, there is no way the United States can leave or abandon the Middle East. What do you think the U.S. role is in the midst of that? Well, there has been some questions about these rules, not by us, by other Middle Eastern leaders. But uh, in fact, uh, we are confident that uh, the United States is with us. They are there to stay. Uh, I mean, not indefinitely, definitely, but as their interest demands. But I believe there should have been more engagement by the US in Iraq particularly during this crisis. There was an opportunity, it was a missed opportunity during the efforts to form this majority government and it was an ideal uh, outcome of the election that the Iraqi are deciding themselves to be sovereign, to be independent, to be in charge of their destiny, their future. This effort should have been supported more. We didn't see that engagement even now, actually, I mean, only recently, uh, the Assistant Secretary Barbara Leaf visited Baghdad and Arbi. She had an excellent visit. She made all the right messages. The Assistant of the Secretary of State was in Arbi recently to sign that the MOU with the, between the DOD and the Peshmerga was another good sign. But honestly, we, we do expect more engagement, more interagency engagement. And this policy should not be controlled or monopolized by, by single agency you see to conduct. I think the situation is unfolding, it's critical. Uh, also, we see what's happening in neighboring Iran of demonstration of the social, cultural implosion. Uh, and also uh, in, in, in Iraq at the same moment, you see, the situation is not settled, it's still chaotic, I have to be very honest with you. Demonstrations, protests are coming very soon, and there will be... The October 1st protests, you're talking about? I think so. Even now, they, they've started to mobilize and all. So to, to keep the country uh, moving uh, forward, really we need the, the positive engagement of all our friends in the international community, especially the United States, who are our closest allies. So speaking of engagement, I've heard any number of Iraqi prime ministers come to Washington 
including Haider al-Abadi in this room, saying the Iranian role in Iraq is unacceptable. It is unacceptable. What's the acceptable Iranian role in Iraq? Well, the acceptable rule to deal with Iraq as a sovereign country on the basis of equality, of mutual respect, to deal with Iraq through the official channels, through the foreign ministry, through the government, not to be in charge of, of the country, to come and go and dictate or choose ministers or choose DG in, in the ministries and so on, or influence the security apparatus of the countries, and also to make illegal deals with, with, with the country, in economic benefit and others. Everything is legal, it should be very open, but uh, no, no Iraqi prime minister, not from Iran, from other countries, from Turkey, from the Arab countries as such. And this is, if you don't respect your soul, yourself, people will not respect you. I mean, that's the bottom line. And this is what is missing in Iraq. Do you think things have changed significantly with regard to the Iranian presence after the assassination of Qasem Soleimani? Uh, no, actually, I, I think their engagement, their meddling in Iraqi affairs is continuing, but it's less effective. So it's the same level of effort, but less level of effective, well, lower uh, level of effectiveness. Exactly. I mean, Soleimani was a different uh, leader, actually. He was uh, decisive. He was a decision maker uh, at the end of the day. But uh, their activity are continuing. They are there most of the time, you see. Uh, have permanent presence, I would say, <laughs> in, in Baghdad and so on. But uh, I mean, we, we want their, their friendship, their neighborhood, their uh, good neighborly relations with them. We respect their interests. There are very, very common ties, religious, cultural, people to people, and so on. Uh, but at the same time, really, there should be limits how much uh, they could interfere in the internal affairs of the country is, is not acceptable. Let me ask a very future-driven question before I go to the audience questions. Everybody in Washington is talking about the energy transition. Yes and what it will mean. Nobody knows when it will come, but it will be big, and it will profoundly affect countries like Iraq. How are Iraqis talking about the looming energy transition, and how Iraqis think they should be preparing for yeah. the energy transition? Well, it's doing its best, but actually there is uh, not much tangible evidence. I mean, uh, in terms of the transition to clean energy to green energy, there are huge potentials. But honestly, I mean, the, the mindset of the culture is not used to change. Uh, I mean, there are plans, there are big plans uh, in the government uh, program and so on. But uh, Iraq is a major source of, of, of hydrocarbon, I think uh, it's using. Uh, Kurdistan is another source, actually, a potential source, especially for gas potentials. And uh, we have also planned, actually, to export uh, these gases to southern Europe to compensate for the lack of Russian, maybe even Iranian. And that's why our facilities are constantly under attack and, and threat by the militias. So it's a bigger game of that. As for Iraq, actually, the main challenge is to be uh, more self-sufficient, more independent of Iranian uh, gas export, and to be linked to the power grid of the GCC, uh, and also to deal with the flaring gas and so on. Uh, so some projects, some international companies are, are working on that. But really, the pace is very slow. I mean, this is not a priority, to be honest right. with you. Right. Let me turn some questions from the audience. My friend Jonathan okay. Lord is here, and he asks, the U.S. government contributes $20 million a month to Peshmerga stipends. What, stapes, what s steps should the KRG be taking to avoid dependency problems and reform the force to a self-sustainable yeah. size. This 
process of reforms of the Peshmerga is ongoing. Uh, many countries are helping us, the, the British, the, some other coalition countries are working on that. Now we have unified about 16 brigades of the Peshmerga, you see, to make them uh, regular, semi-regular brigades. So it is ongoing, to be honest with you. And uh, the KDP from its sides have submitted all its forces under the command of the Peshmerga force, or the Peshmerga ministry, whose uh, minister was here recently. He's not a KDP, he's a PUK. <laughs> but we are waiting for the others to do the same, in fact, in order to unify the accounting, the the integration and so on. So it is moving actually. So well, this, this money is not wasted. I think it's put in the right place uh, to help an ally who fought with you against ISIS and stood with you during uh, many challenges. One of the challenges is size. And of course, if people are in the Peshmerga, they get a salary. Yeah. How much of a reduction do you think the Peshmerga need to take to be sustainable within the the Although I'm, I'm a former Peshmerga, okay, but I really have not be very specific on this. This is a process. The Ministry of Peshmerga of the KRG is doing that, but it is reducing, downsizing, uh, concentrating on talent, on professionalism, on training. Some of the Peshmerga are taking their training at the Sandhurst uh, College in, in London, for instance. Uh, I mean, many countries are giving us a great deal of help, but definitely the the size of the force needs to be reduced to be more agile, more professional, and uh, and combat ready. Uh, Eve Sampson from the Detroit Free Press is here. She says ISIS seems to be a continuing threat, particularly in the Makmur region near the border yes. that splits areas controlled by the KRG in federal Iraq. How does unrest in Baghdad affect the potential for extremist groups like it ISIS does. to grow? I mean, the extremist groups or ISIS um, or before Al-Qaeda when we saw, they thrive, they live on political discourse. And whenever there is uh, sectarian, ethnic, uh, divisions or conflict, really they expand. Uh, during this tension between Baghdad and the KRG, there are some no man lands between the Iraqi army lines and the Peshmerga lines where they operate, they, they are active, they attack the Hajj al Shaabi, they attack the Peshmerga, they attack the uh, security forces. So ISIS is a threat. It's not finished, as many people think, that we are done with them. They are still a living threat to all of us. And so what, what's the connection between Baghdad, the protests, that, to, to Well, definitely, you are one country. You cannot uh, be safe unless the situation in Baghdad is, is uh, settled or are controlled because the spillover really could, could uh, have an effect on, on you also in, in Kurdistan region too. We are taking that into our calculation. Eve Sampson has another question about Please. the attack that you mentioned yes. from the Revolutionary Guard, uh, the Islamic uh, Revolutionary Guard Corps of Iran uh, that killed nine people and wounded 22. Yes. What response do you anticipate from the United States and others, and what response would you like to see? Well, really, I mean, these are violations of Iraq's sovereignty, territorial integrity, and blatant violations in Iraq's internal affairs. I mean, these issues we have discussed with the Iranian, with the IRGC also, how to set up um, a joint security mechanisms to deal with, with their concerns about Iranian oppositions who are present, who are, who are present in, in Soleimania, in, in Iraqi Kurdistan, generally as refugees or political force, and how to control the border from preventing an infiltration. This is a legitimate concern the Iranian have, as well as the Turkish have vis-a-vis -vis the PKK. So 
we are, here are very reasonable on that. But really to take such drastic action to bomb, to shell, you see, indiscriminately. Or last time they fired on Erbil 12 ballistic missiles from inside their territory that they are targeting an Israeli headquarter in Erbil, which proved to be false, okay? Uh, and then also there was no response, to be honest with you. I mean, not by the United States or by other countries except public uh, statement of, of disapproval or, or even not condemnation, I would say. Um, my friend Jerry Thompson, who you may know, yeah. uh, asks on the, on the oil and gas issue, could yes. there be an agreement with the central government where the KRG became the manager of the northern field rather than the owners, supervise operation, production, and export, while the revenues were paid to the central government and the KRG was allocated its share of the budget at 17%. Is yeah. that a possible solution here? Well, we agreed on that basis, you see, on, on the basis of 17% of the annual budget, but really never, ever, the KRG received their share from Baghdad. Even when we were very strong, very strongly represented in Baghdad, uh, our share has been less than that, okay? So there was no commitment from Baghdad at all on, on, on this. But I believe there is a solution, there is uh, room for some compromise, I mean, between Baghdad, and the KRG on the oil and gas. This uh, industry is open, is transparent. Every barrel of the oil you export, where does it go, where it's sold, is, is known in the international market. We have an international company that audit the, the, the production, the sales, uh, Deloitte, which is a famous accounting uh, bank. Just a while ago, they issued their, their finding about the KRG oil sale and uh, how <coughs> they were dispensed. So we have no problem, but I believe the best way is to legislate a new oil and gas for Iraq. And this is what the Constitution demands. Okay, so we would be clear, not every month or every year, will come and beg each other, you see, please pay us our payment for the salaries of our civil servants. I mean, Iraq uh, should be bigger than that, really. I mean, to look upon the Kurdish civil servants as is, they are a separate country. They, they are dealing with us, in fact, <laughs> literally, as we are a separate part of Iraq. You are not my civil servants. Uh, Although Iraq has uh, the border guards is part of the of this of the federal government, the customs now they have their people. The airport, the system, the security systems have been linked with with Baghdad. So there has been a lot of improvement in that. In fact, I mean in terms of integration. Now in Iraq, over more than a million Iraqi Arabs live in, in Kurdistan. <coughs> Permanently, and not to mention the refugees, the, the, the displaced people from many parts of, of Iraq who, who live there. And we won't start fighting about the borders of Kirkuk. The border of Kirkuk, well, it's, it's a contentious issue, problem. Again, this is stated very clearly in the Constitution, Article 140 how the situation in Kirkuk in the disputed areas should be normalized. The biggest threat in Iraq, I'll tell you something, it's not Kirkuk, it's Sinjar, okay? Where Iran is there involved, where the PMF is there, where the PKK is there, when Turkey is there, and also the KDP, the KRG also. We have an agreement with the UN, with Baghdad, with Erbil, to normalize the situation, but both the PMF forces there and the PKK, who are in league, okay, are preventing the return of those dispossessed Yazidis to go back home and to have a local 
administration to, to run their affairs. They have been in camps for, for years, since 2014. I want to go back to the, the, the issue of passing an oil law yes. and normalizing things and, and, and moving forward on a government. Um, we have an anonymous question online about whether there's something positive that can come from the protests. I mean, how do, how, how do you think the political class can be mobilized, pushed, pressured, induced yeah. to change the way Iraqi politics work to serve or to resolve the, the very kinds of issues that you describe as, as so persistently vexing in Iraqi politics? No, the, any protest movement, uh, as long as they're genuine, as we call the Tashrinis, uh, the protests in Iraq, were genuine, were ordinary people. And by the way, the majority, actually, the majority were, were Shia youth who, who came out to the street protesting against the governors, the bad governors, the corruption, the alienations that they have seen. So uh, it was a genuine movement, really. It was not manipulated by Israel, by the United States, by the UAE, or this and that. No, no, it, I think it was a genuine protest movement. They were suppressed very badly, okay? I mean, Hundreds of them were killed. Thousands were maimed, you see, by the security forces, by the militia. And here where we come when we run for the post of the president. Why? Is it a personal vendetta between Barzani and Barham Saleh, you see, to seek this? It wasn't a personal vendetta at all. It was, it's the position of the president of the republic to be the protector of the constitution. He should stand for those people who were killed. They should, those people, the culprits should be brought to justice. When the federal court issue unconstitutional decision against your people, against your region, you should stand up and say, this is not constitutional. And that's why, why he doesn't do it. Okay? So I think this protest movement is genuine. It, it, unfortunately, we expected after the last October uh, elections that they will form a, uni a unified platform to be a force to be record. Many of the independents really were elected uh, by the new electoral law, but uh, they failed to transform themselves into a political parliamentary platform to be of, of significance. So they were divided or both by this side or that side. They couldn't form a unified uh, position. But definitely they have an impact. They were one of the main reasons that we had an early election. It was one of their main demand calling for an early election, you see, with a new electoral law, with uh, some monitoring and so on. Uh, but now the situation will be different. I personally believe uh, the Sadrists uh, have been pushed outside this process. They will not accept that position whatsoever. And they have a massive popular base. With the Tashrini, they could join forces and would be a formidable force in the streets in the coming days. We have a lot to look for. A lot to look forward to. Hoshar Zabari, thank you so Not much for all. joining us. It's good to see you again. Good thank you very much for joining us at CSS. We hope to see you again soon. Thank, thank you. you.